We don't always think about the little rules that govern our behavior, but we can usually tell if something about an interaction is off. For instance, imagine there's a cafe, and I see the barista wearing a Star Wars pin. I recognize the reference, so I say, may the force be with you. She'd think I was acting strange if I followed up with, that's a quote from George Lucas used in the well-known Star Wars series. When we talk about ideas and phrases that someone else said first, we use different ways of acknowledging that we didn't come up with them ourselves. Sometimes the reference only requires a quick mention, and other times we share a lot of information to give due credit. In writing, there's a wide variety of ways to share the stage with another writer, using their words or ideas, but also making your own contributions. We'll talk about how to work with others' words today in Study Hall Composition, presented by Arizona State University and Crash Course. I'm Yimna Sami, and let's get started. Depending on our experiences in school or work, we might be really afraid of plagiarism, the act of using someone else's ideas or words without giving them appropriate credit. In school and professional settings, plagiarism is considered a major problem. When people suspect you've taken someone else's ideas or words and claimed them as your own, they have a hard time trusting you in the future. That's because they may consider plagiarism cheating or even a kind of identity theft. Ideas are, in some ways, more precious than property. You could face consequences like failed assignments or distrust in your workplace. But we know that the rules and expectations for how to acknowledge sources can feel overwhelming. We'll explore some tools to make sure you're crediting your sources even if the standards are complex. But before we talk in depth about how to avoid plagiarism, let's focus on how we actually want to treat other people's words in our writing. We want to give them credit and still do interesting work where we add to the conversations being had. To start, we want to avoid setting other people's ideas up as being undeniable evidence of how right we are, or you know, how wrong they are. There's a common misconception that source material is just there to confirm what we've already said, or just for us to tear down. Rather, we want to explain and then respond to the people who we include in our work. Consider your writing as one statement in a much larger conversation. You're in a dialogue with the people whose words and ideas you include in your project. The conversation will continue after your particular writing project too. This is because knowledge grows incrementally, and conversations within and between pieces of writing slowly create new knowledge over time. It can be uncomfortable to realize that nothing is really ever settled, there's always the possibility of new information. But this lets us focus on interesting, complex ideas rather than trying to shut down all debate forever. We use other people's words and ideas in a few different ways. As writers, we can think of them as quotation, paraphrase, and explanation. Quotation is when we represent the exact words of others because their phrasing is brief and clear or contains clever insight we want to share with our readers. This is when we have those double quotation marks. Don't miss a single word and cite the person who made the statement. Paraphrasing is not word for word quotation, but it is a representation of someone else's ideas. It's when we rewrite someone else's work in our own words, either to save space or to put our own unique spin on it. If I want to quickly compare three sources in a single sentence, I'll paraphrase their main points rather than shoving three quotations into a clunky, page long sentence. We still include a citation when we paraphrase. Even though we rewrite the idea to make it quicker and clearer for our work, we still want to give credit to the original thinker or writer. We also want to let our readers know where they can find more on that topic, which is another major goal of citing our sources. Citations, by the way, are accepted ways of expressing where other people's words or ideas came from, and they can include information like the person's name, their book, article, or chapter title, and even the page of the book where they came from. Our citation depends on the context in which we write. On Twitter, for instance, it might be enough to include the handle of the person you're quoting. But in a scientific research report, you may have to include a lot more information because that's the norm for citing in that context. Lastly, explanation is where you further shed light on either your own ideas or the ideas of someone else. It's often used in combination with paraphrasing and quotation because it helps your reader continue to process the deeper meanings from the quotes or paraphrases. A quotation without any kind of explanation afterward is called a drop quote. The drop refers to the quote just parachuting into the text dropping in without clear reasons for being there. You know, I think about that sandwich a lot. Huh, I just said something totally irrelevant in the middle of this video. As it turns out, it's a quotation from the 2015 season of The Great British Baking Show, but you wouldn't know because I didn't tell you anything about it and I didn't explain it afterward. Well, now I did, but you know what I mean. Perhaps you've referenced a quote from a book or TV show to your friends, only to get blank stares that signaled they need more context. Just because the quote seemed useful to me doesn't mean my audience will automatically get it. The bad news is that we have to figure out a way to avoid drop quotes because they confuse our readers. 
The good news is that engaging deeply with every quote will make our writing much stronger, while also helping us avoid plagiarism. Let's go a little deeper on the formatting of citations, since we don't give credit in the same way in every situation. I'll be real here. Some of the rules for citation are super complex and difficult to wade through. That being said, the citation systems you might use from APA to MLA style will help you make sure you cite in a recognizable way for your field. Even if you feel confused about citation formatting, don't let fear of getting it wrong make you give up. Ignoring citation is where plagiarism starts to happen. The best way to avoid plagiarism is to engage with the source material. Make it super clear which ideas came from where and which parts of your writing are your own responses and ideas. Then you can focus on getting the format correct for your citations by looking up examples and checking with the style guide, a physical or online document detailing the rules and formatting guides you're expected to follow in that particular field. A biochemistry paper has a different style guide than a nonfiction book about linguistics, and online articles have a bunch of different standards. Now that we've got the basics of quotation and citation down, we can really dive into strategies for creating great conversations with your source material. It can take some practice, but you can remember how to do so using the swag technique. Yeah, that's swag with two Gs. This technique helps you introduce and explain your sources thoroughly, and it also serves as a handy revision checklist. Here's how it goes. S is for stage setting. Provide some context for what is happening in your text and show why you might need a quote or paraphrase to support your point. W is for words. This is the quotation or paraphrase of someone else's ideas. A is for attribution. Tell the reader where the words or ideas come from. Small note, this sometimes makes more sense right before the quote. It just depends. G is to go into detail. Explain to your readers what words or ideas mean and why they are important. G, the second one, is for going forward. Don't just leave that explanation hanging. Take your readers forward by connecting that explanation to whatever you wanna write about next. This keeps everything flowing because there's no abrupt change of topic. Anytime you need to reference someone else's words or ideas, use this technique. Checking for it each time can help you get into great habits and avoid plagiarism. To see how it works, let's go to a writer in action. Parker is working on a poetry analysis paper. They know that they can't make their point about Tarfia Faizullah's work effectively without direct quotes, but they don't want to create a drop quote or forget a citation either. Parker follows swag to make sure their ideas are fully incorporated while still citing sources correctly. They start with setting the stage. Tarfia Faizullah's poems often confront histories people find hard to face. They then include the quote with a little citation ahead of it to help the reader know where the quote is from. In her book, Seam, she says, it wasn't enough light to see clearly by, but I still turned my face toward it. Parker knows that this quote won't automatically matter to readers, so they go into detail. She succinctly acknowledges the imperfections of looking back in history without letting herself be swayed toward ignoring the past and its persisting effects. They think this is an accurate summary of the quote. Plus, they got to use the word succinctly in a sentence. It sounds so nice. Parker then uses an explanation to go forward to another section of their paper, widening out the analysis. Faizullah's work may draw on a particular historical time frame, but often offers a compelling lens for other broader questions of history. Parker pauses and tries out other words like window, glass, telescope, etc., before sticking with lens. Parker then uses the MLA citation style the professor suggests, including both in-text citation and an entry into their work cited list at the end of the paper. They might have to look up examples to see how this works, but they can handle it. Parker's a writer in action. So yes, the dire warning about plagiarism in most school settings can make us scared. The rules vary so much across disciplines that it makes following them a real ordeal at times. That being said, we want to approach adding our ideas to a body of knowledge as a conversation. And doing that means acknowledging which ideas inspired us or made us think about something new. The SWAG acronym lets us mirror how new knowledge is created as we carefully introduce and acknowledge the influence of others on our work. Don't be afraid to be part of the conversation. Just be careful and conscientious. You might find yourself noticing citations in everyday life, from Star Wars quotes on pins to casual conversations among friends that loop in Twitter handles for support. Tune in next time, where we'll turn our attention to critical thinking and argumentation, diving in beyond the buzzwords to how these ideas can help us write. Thanks for watching Study Hall Composition, which is produced by Arizona State University and the Crash Course team at Complexly. If you like this video and want to keep learning with us here in Study Hall, be sure to subscribe. You can learn more about ASU and the videos produced by Crash Course in the links in the description. See you next time.